A young girl of about eight years of age tries to play the piano under the watchful gaze of her piano teacher, Mizuki. Mizuki instructs the little girl to play nice and slow, following her own tempo, while she watches. Mizuki is a lonely teacher who lost her husband three years back and has never moved on from his death because he simply disappeared one day. Because it was so sudden, Mizuki never understood why he did what he did. With so many questions and bitterness in her mind, she keeps wondering what happened to him. And without being able to get closure, Mizuki only trudges through life. After her lesson, her student's mother asks Mizuki why her daughter is playing so badly after two years of learning from her. Mizuki replies that the girl can continue and that she has been trying hard, but the girl's mother thinks that Mizuki is too lenient. She's calm and soft-spoken, and prefers pushing the girl with soft words of encouragement rather than using a stern approach, the same way her own teacher did to her when she was a child. The mother, however, wants her daughter to learn more upbeat and difficult songs and she subtly offends Mizuki by saying that maybe the problem is her and her gloominess. Mizuki nods and accepts the offense without saying anything to defend herself or her abilities. She just goes with the flow. After the class, Mizuki goes to the supermarket and buys flour to make red bean dumplings. They were her husband's favorite food. Her house is silent and dark. Mizuki carefully prepares the dumplings only for herself. She puts a couple on boiling water and while she is slowly stirring the dumplings, she suddenly feels as if she's being watched. In an empty house, the feeling is quite ominous. She quietly looks over her shoulder, expecting to see nothing. But to her surprise there's a man wearing a yellow coat with dark clothes underneath staring at her. Although the man appeared out of thin air, Mizuki doesn't freak out. She doesn't even look disturbed by his presence, quite the opposite. She welcomes him home. The man asks her how long he has been gone and Mizuki replies that it's been three years. Turns out the man is her missing, and supposedly dead, husband, Yusuk. Like it was another Tuesday, Yusuke sighs and comments that it's been a while, then he approaches Mizuki. Before he gets any closer to her, she quickly points out that he's still wearing his shoes inside the house. The man apologizes and hastily moves to the hall to take off his boots as the tradition dictates. Mizuki follows after him, afraid that she might be hallucinating and he will soon disappear. She stops at the doorway, afraid of looking and not seeing him anymore. Fortunately, Yusuke comes back, without shoes this time, and smiles while looking around the house and commenting that nothing has changed. He's excited when he notices what she's cooking, and she offers to serve him some. Yusuke sits at the table and Mizuki watches him eating with rapt attention. She can barely even blink. Yusuke notices her taken aback expression and asks if she's surprised to see him. She says she is. She tries to explain that the reason she's so surprised is because he's dead, but he beats her to it and completes her reasoning. He knows he's dead. He tells her that his body is lost in the sea being eaten by crabs. She wouldn't be able to find it even if she tried. He nonchalantly continues to eat the dumplings and informs Mizuki that he supposed he was sick at the time, though he didn't know it back then. She wonders if it was because of her that he did what he did, and he emphatically denies it. Yusu clarifies that he has always been stressed from work and that it happened too fast. Once he was in the water, he couldn't come back because the sea dragged him down to its depths and hid him like a secret. Mizuki replies that she thought it was a water accident, and Yusuke informs her that he didn't suffer. Mizuki smiles, relieved. Yusuke stands up after eating and complimenting Mizuki's dumplings again, much to her delight. She follows his movements with laser focus, afraid that he might disappear again. When he doesn't, she brings the dishes to the sink and, with her back turned to him, says that she looked everywhere for him. In temples, churches, parks and even where homeless people stay. Yusuke asks if she really thought he would be living with the homeless people and she replies that she had no other options. He casually states that she shouldn't have looked for him. For the first time since he reappeared in her life, Mizuki loses her meek composure and stalks to him, asking why he didn't want her to look for him. Yusuke deflects and wonders if she has tidied his study. Mizuki answers that it's exactly the way he left it, but that she had to look into it after he disappeared. Yusuke moves towards his study, and Mizuki runs after him, but this time he disappears as quickly as he appeared. She frantically calls for him while looking for him around the house until he appears again and asks why she's so distressed, while sitting on the couch staring at her with an unconcerned expression. Mizuki nervously wonders if she can turn on the light, but he orders her to sit next to him. They sit side by side and Yusuke says that it was a long way for him to get home. That not many dead people can make the journey because it's exhausting and they soon realize that it's not their place anymore. Then, they disappear before the journey is complete. Mizuki wakes up by herself the following morning. She thinks that seeing Yusuke was a weird dream. She goes to the kitchen and things are just as she left them the night previous. But what surprises her is the dish that Yusuke used to eat the dumplings in the sink. She watches it and when she turns around, she sees Yusuke sitting on the floor with a pile of CDs next to him. Mizuki takes the opportunity that he has decided to show up again to answer all her questions about him and his sudden death. The first one is if he blames her for not noticing that he was sick. Once again, Yusuke repeats that not even he knew that he was sick. It came all too sudden and at that point, no one could stop it from festering, not even her. They stay silent for a moment until Mizuki notices that Yusuke is wearing shoes inside the house again, and points it out to him. 
Yusuke hurriedly starts taking them off when Mizuki suddenly runs to him and tackles him with a hug. She cries and asks him to stay with her forever. Instead of saying that he can't, Yusuke invites her to come with him on a journey to some beautiful places to meet the people who took care of him on his way back to her. He fears that he has abandoned them and that they still need his help. Mizuki asks if it will take a long time, and Yusuke says it will. Yusuke and Mizuki pack their bags and get ready for their journey. Mizuki tries to hide the 100 pages prayer that she wrote for Yusuke, but he sees it and asks to take a look. She explains that she wrote a hundred times for him to be safe, and though she didn't believe it would work, it gave her a purpose and a way to grieve. Yusuke jokingly points out that she didn't do a good job and that the handwriting is horrible, and Mizuki takes it back and justifies that she put a lot of effort in it. He tells her to bring the prayer with him and to burn it when she comes back home. She wonders what is going to happen when she burns the prayer and Yusuke replies that they won't know until she does it. Mizuki puts it in her bag and they leave for their trip. They decide to go by train and soon arrive at the station. Strangely enough, Mizuki isn't the only one who can see Yusuke, because he casually asks for information from a security man. In the train, a little boy approaches him and touches his leg while staring at Mizuki. She finds it all very weird, after all usually people don't see ghosts. They arrive in a small town, but Yusuke seems lost. Mizuki tells him that they should go back home if he doesn't know where he is, but Yusuke ignores her. He sees someone he knows and runs after the person calling their name in the middle of the street. He finally approaches an old name riding a motorcycle and delivering newspapers around the neighborhood. His name is Mr. Shimekage. Yusuke introduces Mizuki to him and tells her that Mr. Shimekage took care of him. They follow the old man to the newspaper warehouse and he asks Yusuke to fix his computer because it was broken again. While Yusuke tries to fix it, Mr. Shimekage explains to a very confused Mizuki that they are a small newspaper's distributor, and that Yusuke helped them a lot. He wonders if they are going to spend the night, but Mizuki has no idea. When the man is leaving, though, she tells him that if they are staying, she's going to make dinner. He ignores her and leaves the room. Later on, Mizuki cleans the dishes after dinner while Mr. Shimekage and Yusuke watch TV. Mr. Shimekage suddenly turns the TV off and grabs a newspaper to read. Yusuke silently asks him what he thinks of Mizuki, and if she looks like another woman. Mr. Shimekage says he's disappointed because she doesn't look like this person at all. Mizuki overhears them talking and gets confused. When they are preparing to go to bed, she wonders if he worked there distributing newspapers and he replies that he did, but not for long. She jokingly comments that it's hard to believe it and Yusuke confesses that it was a nice routine. Mizuki finally asks who they were talking about during dinner, and Yusuke explains that they were talking about Mr. Shimekage, wife, who left him. Yusuke thought that Mizuki looked like her. He explains that he told Mr. Shimekage that he would bring her there with him. He also admits that Mr. Shimekage is like him, a dead man walking and that's why his wife left him. Mr. Shimekage has no idea that he's dead, and he doesn't know that Yusuke is dead too. Mizuki finds it astonishing that a person doesn't know that they died. Yusuke reveals that one day, when he was still working for the old man, he had a dream and discovered how Mr. Shimekage had died. It was a scary dream. They hear an ominous sound of footsteps coming from outside of their bedroom and Mizuki is a bit scared. It's just Mr. Shimekage going to bed, but it's still frightening now that she knows he is also some sort of ghost. Next morning, Mizuki wakes up to the sound of birds singing outside. She turns to check if Yusuke is still there with her and sees him with his eyes closed. She comes closer to him to listen to his breathing, and it's a relief when his breath comes out. On her way to make breakfast, she sees Mr. Shimekage arranging his newspapers by himself and decides to offer him help. He tells her that his fingers aren't nimble anymore and while they work, he keeps rubbing his fingers. Later on, she goes to a grocery store to buy food and sees Mr. Shimekage delivering the newspapers. She excitedly asks him what he wants for dinner, but he doesn't even look at her. It's as if she's invisible to him. She watches as he goes away and in the blink of an eye, he completely disappears. Mizuki hurriedly runs back to the newspaper warehouse and frantically looks for Mr. Shimekage, but he's not there. Yusuke appears and greets her, not noticing anything wrong. Mizuk doesn't mention what she saw happening to Mr. Shimekage. During dinner, the old man is back and they all eat together. When they are in bed, Mizuki finally asks Yusuke why he came back. Instead of answering her question, he tells her he loves her. The following day, Mizuki sees Mr. Shimekage cutting pictures of flowers from newspapers' flyers. He tells her that it's his hobby, but that for a long time he felt dejected and didn't want to indulge in it anymore. Mizuki happily shows him a picture with a bouquet and he compliments her. Yusuke enters the room carrying the computer he was fixing and sadly informs Mr. Shimekage that the computer wasn't going to work anymore. Mizuki, seeing how sad they both look, tells them that they maybe could buy a new one. But they both completely ignore her again and decide to do a farewell party for the broken computer. Mizuki is left confused again. Later on, Mizuki is making dinner when Mr. Shimekage walks in and sees a cast iron pan heating in the stove. He asks her what's doing there and she apologizes for taking it without asking. He gets upset and bumps into a wall, whining. Yusuke tells him that he wanted to eat a stew and that's why Mizuki was using the pan. 
Mr. Shimekage explains that the pan is impregnated with oil and memories. He says that he threw that same pan once and it hit his wife in the head. Because of his violence, his wife ended things with him. After telling them that, the old man stomps out of the kitchen, feeling emotional. Mizuki quickly turns the stove off and asks Yusuke if she should stop cooking. He says no and runs after Mr. Shimekage. The old man is sitting on a bench in a park, drinking his sorrows away. Yusuke tells him to come back home so that they can eat the stew together. Mr. Shimekage drunkenly wonders why things are so complicated. Then he tells Yusuke that he has to go. Yusuke laughs and carries the old man back to his house. On the way, Mr. Shimekage admits to doing bad things to his wife. He thought that if he kept going like that, he would lose her for good. He finished by saying that now that Yusuke came back, everything will be okay. When they arrive at the house, Mr. Shimekage is sleeping, so Mizuki helps Yusuke carry him to his bedroom. The couple has fun putting Mr. Shimekage in bed, and when they turn the lights in his bedroom on, they see a surprising sight. The wall behind the man's bed is filled with flowers cut from flyers, probably in tribute to his wife. Mizuki and Yusuke are both speechless, and even when they are lying down to sleep, they don't know what to say. Mizuki wonders if Mr. Shimekage will ever see his wife again, but Yusuke doesn't know. He says that Mr. Shimekage will only be at peace when he does what he needs to do at his own pace. Yusuke turns his back to Mizuki to sleep. She tries initiating intimacy with him, but he flinches away from her and tells her they are not going to do that. Mizuki gets upset and asks why. Yusuke only apologizes. That same night, Mr. Shimekage finally gets his last rest. When Mizuki wakes and goes to the kitchen, she passes by the same room where Mr. Shimekage separated the newspapers, and it's in shambles. Mizuki gasps and trembles when she sees it because it looks as if no one had lived there in years. The windows are all broken, there is dirty on the floor and water leaking from the pipes. The only thing that proved she was going crazy was a single rose picture on the floor. The rest of the building is the same, and his bedroom was empty. Even his wall full of flowers has deteriorated. It's as if no one had lived there in years. Mizuki and Yusuke move on to their next stop. Now, they go to a restaurant and meet the owner. As with Mr. Shimekage, the owner, Jinai, seemed to know Yusuke and was also surprised to see him there again. Mizuki and Yusuke help him and his wife, Fuji, manage the restaurant. Fuji mentions that Yusuke is a decorator in Tokyo, something that surprises Mizuki because Yusuke was actually a dentist. When the couple is distracted, Mizuki asks if Yusuke just made up the fact that he's a decorator, and he laughs. At night, when they are getting ready to sleep, Yusuke tells Mizuki that the first time he ate Fuji and Jinai's dumplings, he thought they were delicious. She replies that she thought so, too. He explains that he didn't have any money to pay for the food, but the nice couple let him work for it. Mizuki finally asks if they are also dead, but Yusuke replies that they are like her. Then, he mysteriously says that he bet they lived a nice life. The following day, they help at the crowded restaurant. Mizuki notices that her hands are softer than they used to be, but Fuji explains that it must be the water. Later on, they go to a supermarket and a Buddhist monk stares at them. Mizuki tries to make Yusuke leave because according to her, the man gives her the creeps, but Yusuke reassures her that everything is alright. The man approaches and asks Yusuke if he's the fireman, and after Yusuke denies it, he leaves. It's so abrupt and random that they laugh and Mizuki tells Yusuke that he makes an impression on people. When they are leaving the supermarket, Mizuki suddenly says that she wants to stay in that city with Yusuke forever, even though she knows it's impossible. Back at the restaurant, Mizuki helps Fuji organize their party room because someone was going to throw a party there. There's a piano in the room and Mizuki asks Fuji if she plays. Fuji replies that she used to when she was a child, but that she didn't like it very much. Mizuki tells her that she also didn't like it, but she had to study because her parents told her so. She says that she was always told by her piano teacher that she needed to listen to her own sound, to concentrate on it and listen carefully, and that no matter what she thought about it, the sound was herself. She also tells Fuji that her parents had passed away a long time ago. At night, Yusuke watches Mizuki folding clothes with a soft smile. He tells her that she's tough, and that even if she was crying her eyes out, she would manage to eat something. She replies that if she's alone, there's nothing she can do but move on. Yusuke tells her that she did move on during the three years he had been dead. Mizuki's mood instantly sours and she tells him that he has no idea what she felt during those years without him. He chuckles and says he's joking. Again she asks if he doesn't want to stay there, and he answers that it would have been a nice life to have, compared to being a dentist in a big city. Later, when Yusuke is already fast asleep, Mizuki sits next to him and touches his face in fascination. Next day, Yusuke is helping Jinai make dumplings when his hands fumble and he drops one. Like with Mr. Shimekage, Yusuke also seems to be getting weaker. They go to a bathing house together and Mizuki relaxes. She's happy and loosened up after taking a hot bath, and she tells Yusuke that might be her favorite moment ever. The following day, Mizuki plays a song on the piano and when she hears it, Fuji comes running and asks her what she's doing. She tells Mizuki that she never gave her permission to play. Mizuki profusely apologizes for her mistake and fumbles around the room to find something to do after the awkward moment. Fuji asks if she's a professional, and Mizuki explains that she only teaches children. 
She apologizes again and says she understands why no one but the owner should touch the instrument. Fuji questions if she has any brothers or sisters, and Amazuki denies it. Fuji replies that she doesn't understand, then. She confesses that she had a sister eight years younger than her who died, and the piano belonged to her. The song Mizuki played was the same her sister played over and over when she was a child, so much that Fuji got annoyed with it and slapped her. She said some hurtful things to her sister and not long after that, she died. Because of that, Fuji also stopped playing. Her parents tried to throw the piano away, but Fuji didn't let them. She brought it to her house, and it has been left unused for years. The problem is that the piano carries so many hurtful memories that Fuji feels as if it got tangled round her food like the string of a kite. While she speaks about how much the string tightens around her, the light in the room darkens. Fuji wishes that she could go back in time to apologize to her sister. She has always regretted the way she treated her, and it still haunts her even after 30 years. Fuji's little sister suddenly appears in front of her. She stares at the piano, so Mizuki suggests trying to teach her. The girl approaches the piano and starts playing. Mizuki helps her out when she stumbles, and she finally plays beautifully. Fuji watches it and silently cries. When the little girl finishes the song, she smiles at Mizuki and vanishes. Next day, Mizuki and Yusuke leave again. This time they take the bus, and Yusuke asks Mizuki for a motion sickness medicine. She hands him her purse and he finds a letter that she sent to his mistress, asking if she knew where he was. Yusuke asks why she wrote a letter to her, and Mizuki scornfully replies that she thought he might be at her house with her. Yusuke scoffs in disbelief and Mizuki explains that she didn't know anything, that she found out through his emails. He calls her silly and Mizuki accuses him of exchanging many emails with the woman. He even talked about the quality of the sheets at the hotel he stayed with her in. Mizuki says she was so angry, but that it gave her strength. In the end, the letter became her lucky charm, and she doesn't let Yusuke throw it away. Yusuke tells her that it was just a game and that the woman wasn't important to him. Mizuki angrily asks if he would say that to Tomoko's face. He doesn't reply so Mizuki tells him that they should meet her, then they would find out if she really wasn't important to him. Mizuki is so mad at him that she gets off at the wrong stop and Yusuke follows after her. He tells her that it happened a long time ago, but she denies it. She yells at him that for her it's not over. She asks if he would never tell her, and he weakly says he forgot. Mizuki will never forget it. It doesn't matter how many years go by. She runs away from him and waits for another bus to pass while Yusuke watches. In the following scene, Mizuki wakes in her bedroom with her alarm clock ringing. She walks out of the bedroom to find her plants dead for the lack of water. Her bag is thrown on the floor and there is a stack of bills for her to pay. One of the many letters she finds is from Yusuke's work. She goes there and surprisingly meets with Tomoko, his mistress. They are civil with each other, and Tomoko invites her for tea. Tomoko looks very similar to Mizuki in terms of looks and clothing style. Tomoko asks if she has any news about Yusuke, and Mizuki answers that she knows where he is. Tomoko seems relieved and explains to Mizuki that she was worried about him. Mizuki replies that he contacted her and told her that he was fine. It seems as if that scene happened right after Yusuke disappeared because Mizuki tells Tomoko that Yusuke won't be working at the hospital anymore. Tomoko tells her that she's going to inform the director of the hospital and Mizuki thanks her. They are silent for a moment before Tomoko says that she was curious to know what kind of person Yusuke would be married to. She tells Mizuki that she's just like she had imagined, and that it was a bit anticlimactic. Mizuki replies that she was also curious to meet Tomoko, because while she was searching for Yusuke, thinking about her somehow gave her strength. Tomoko strangely confesses that she is the kind of woman that prefers for the man she loves to be dead than to be with another woman. Mizuki replies that unfortunately for her, Yusuke is alive, and she understands him more than before after meeting her. Tomoko interrupts her to ask if that's why she was there, but Mizuki smiles and says that she just wanted Tomoko to know that they were a perfectly normal married couple. She adds that she would never hope that someone like Tomoko would understand how a married couple's relationship worked. Surprisingly, Tomoko admits that she understands because not only is she also married, but she's having a baby. She tells Mizuki that after her baby, she will have a very ordinary life until the day she dies. The way she speaks, it seems as if she's throwing the fact that she's having a baby and moving on with her life at Mizuki's face. Mizuki is shaken to her core with that information, and may be wondering if the baby is Yusuke's. She goes back home and angrily throws all her letters away and cleans her house. As she's watering her plants, Mizuki suddenly has an epiphany and runs to the kitchen. She starts making the same dumplings she was making when Yusuke appeared the first time. It works. Yusuke reappears wearing the same clothes from before. Mizuki is as in awe as the first time he popped up in their house. Yusuke hugs her while she cries in relief. They go back to their journey and meet another old man called Hashitani, a farmer. Hashitani is really happy and excited at seeing Yusuke again. Hashitani invites them to his house and shows Yusuke the notebook that he has kept all this time for him. Yusuke explains that he used to teach all kinds of things in the village, something that surprises Mizuki again. Hashitani tells her that Yusuke's classes were really interesting and everyone was hooked. As they sit to chat in the living room, a young girl suddenly appears. It's Kioru, Hashitani's daughter-in-law. 
Hashitani asks Kaoru to bring them something to eat, and the silent girl does as he says. Hashitani explains to Mizuki that Kaoru isn't rude, just a bit slow. Mizuki feels sorry for her and tries to go help her, but Hashitani denies her request because she's a guest. Kaoru's son, Ryota, also appears looking for his mother, and he's really happy when he sees Yusuke. He goes around the village yelling at everyone that Yusuke's back, and every single person in the village goes to the village school to meet him. Yusuke starts teaching about particles and they all listen attentively. There are mostly older people there, but there are also some kids of Ryota's age and teenagers. After the class, Mizuki points out that Yusuke is quite popular there too, and that she's discovering a whole new side to him. She asks him if she can tell him a story from before she met him. She tells him that it's the only thing that she has never told him before. About six months after she entered college, she went out with a guy that had been a year above her. The relationship lasted for four and a half years, and they went to meals, concerts, and spent the night at each other's place. Even if they had a good relationship, she doesn't know why they never mentioned marriage. The idea never occurred to them. So after they broke up, there was nothing left lingering in her mind. She remarks that people's relationships are strange and that they never once talked about it during their marriage. Yusuke replies that he's happy she told him, that it's much better than not knowing. Mizuki smiles and tells him that there are a lot of things that she hasn't told him. Yusuke jokingly replies that it's a bit worrying that she's hiding things from him. Mizuki grins and proudly says that she's going to keep them a secret. The next day, Mizuki visits the local school because Ryota forgot his lunchbox and while wandering around searching for him, she sees Kaoru hopping around in a grass field. As Mizuki approaches, Kaoru is staring at nothing. She calls for her and Kaoru turns around, startled. Mizuki wonders what she's doing and Kaoru explains that she saw a quail, but it's flown away. Mizuki asks if she's okay and Kaoru replies that she is and that she shouldn't have been hunting the quail anyway. Mizuki shows Kaoru the lunchbox that she forgot to give to Ryota and explains that she couldn't find him at the school. Kaoru takes the lunchbox bag and apologizes, saying that she doesn't know what's going through her head at the moment. Mizuki notices that Kaoru is probably full of things to do, and offers to take the lunchbox to Ryota anyway. Kaoru thanks her and tells Mizuki that Ryota is probably at the waterfall. He goes there a lot, but Kaoru doesn't know why. They stare at each other for some time, and it's as if Kaoru sees the pain that Mizuki is trying to hide with her smiles. Mizuki breaks the strange moment and asks for the lunchbox. Moving on, Mizuki starts looking for Ryota and passes through the woods surrounding the village until she finds the waterfall. Ryota's bicycle is there so he must be too. Mizuki finds the boy immobile on top of a rock, watching the waterfall as if waiting for something to happen. Mizuki calls his name and shows him the lunchbox. Ryota surprised that she came all the way over there to bring him the lunchbox and with the honesty of a child remarks that she mustn't have much to do. Mizuki laughs and tells him that she does have a lot of free time. Instead of taking the lunchbox, Ryota goes back to fixedly watching the waterfall. He turns to Mizuki and asks if she is easily frightened. Mizuki says that she doesn't know and he says that he won't show her something if she is. Mizuki replies that it must be something really interesting. Ryota goes down to the waterfall and points at a black area right under the waterfall. He tells her that it's a cave and that it's the pathway to hell. He swears that it's a portal to another world. Mizuki notices how interested and excited about it he is and gets worried that he will try to swim under it. She tells him that if it's really a path to another world, then he shouldn't go there so often. Ryota calls her a coward, and Mizuki replies that it's not like that. He asks if she wants to go in, and she wonders how. He explains that she has to jump in the water with a big splash and go through the cave while holding her breath. Behind the waterfall, she can reach the other world. Mizuki looks very worried and frightened that it must be from there that Yusuke came from. Ryota asks who she is talking about and she replies that it's Yusuke. Ryota states that Yusuke came from the town by bus with his mother. Back at Hashitani's house, Mizuki is in the living room with Hashitani when Kaoru brings her tea. When they are alone again, Hashitani asks Mizuki what she thinks of Kaoru. He mentions that it's been two years since his son has passed, and though she has calmed down now, a lot of things had been going on when he was still alive. His son and Kaoru wanted to sell the land, but Hashitani didn't. They argued about it and right after their fight, his son died. Apparently he died from the cold like a dog. Hashitani admits that it was quite a shock when he heard about it and he wanted to go and fetch his ashes, but Kaoru insisted on going alone. Kaoru went and he didn't hear from her for a long time. Mizuki finds it strange, but doesn't say anything. Hashitani goes on to say that he couldn't cope with losing both his son and daughter-in-law so close to one another. But after he had given up hope, Kaoru suddenly reappeared with Yusuke. The story they told is that Yusuke approached her because he was starving. But Kaoru also looked as if she was about to fall down from hunger. She was skin and bones, with bruises littering her arms and legs. She didn't want to say where she had been or what she had been doing. And ever since that day, she has been absent-minded. It was as if her soul had flown away from her body whenever he asked her to do anything. Mizuki already knows what happened to Kaoru, but she doesn't mention it to Hashitani for obvious reasons. Hashitani asks her if she has been to the waterfall already, and she says she did. 
He confesses to not believing the legends about the cave under the waterfall, but at the same time he feels as if Kaoru isn't alive anymore. He's hopeless, though, because no one can help. He says he couldn't bear if anyone else were to die and Kaoru knows he feels that way, that's why she stays. But Hashitani doesn't think it will last. After her talk to Hashitani, Mizuki worriedly asks Yusuke if Kaoru is the same as he is, and he replies that they are totally different. He explains that her husband is the same as he is, but not her. He says that the first time he saw them together, his attention went to her husband, not Kaoru. The husband had already started to fall apart and he was still taking Kaoru from one place to another. Mizuki asks what happened to the husband, but Yusuke doesn't know because he abandoned him. She wonders what will happen to him and Yusuke replies that he's becoming something indescribable, something hideous. As they talk about the husband, a strong gust of wind blows the curtains of the house away. Yusuke seems worried for a moment, but when Mizuki asks if something is wrong, he denies it. Still, Mizuki is disturbed to know that there's a wandering ghost in the village and that soon he'll turn into something out of that world. Next day, she goes back to the school with Ryota's lunch again. On her way to the waterfall, she sees Kaoru in a plantation. The woman is staring at something that only she can see. Their eyes meet and Mizuki silently shows her Ryota's lunch and motions that she's taking it to him in the waterfall. Kaoru thanks her from afar and Mizuki leaves. As she passes through the woods again, another gust of wind blows the leaves and frightens her. When she arrives at the waterfall, Ryota isn't there. She stares at the cave under the waterfall for a moment, almost hypnotized by it, but she shakes herself off and leaves to find Ryota. Before she can get very far, Mizuki suddenly feels as if someone is watching her. It's the same feeling she had when Yusuke appeared in her house and she had her back turned to him. Another strong wind blows in her direction, and she hears a strange whistle in the air. She walks in the direction of the sound and sees a man with his back turned to her. She asks out loud who he is, and when he turns around, she instantly recognizes him. The man has shaggy black hair and wears casual clothes. It's Mizuki's father. He tells her he's glad that she remembers him. Mizuki approaches him and asks how he could be there. Her father replies that he has been very worried about her and that he has been watching over her since he died when she was 16. He also approaches her and confesses that when she married Yusuke, he thought she would have many problems. That all he could hope is that nothing bad would happen. Mizuki wonders if he suspected that she would end up like that, and he says yes. He apologizes to her and Mizuki assures it wasn't his fault, that Yusuke was sick. Her father gets upset and snaps at her that she shouldn't defend Yusuke. Her father is angry at the things Yusuke did to Mizuki. Mizuki asks if he knows that her mother passed away five years back, and he nods. She wonders if he has seen her mother again on the other side and what is it like there. Her father smiles and replies that it's peaceful. He asks her to not worry about them and to forget Yusuke. Mizuki lies to him that she will, and asks him to tell her mother that. Her father silently stares at her but doesn't say anything. She goes back to the school and meets Yusuke. She also finds Ryato playing with the other kids and gives him his lunchbox. Back at the house, she and Yusuke cook and then she watches as he fumbles to open a package. He has barely any strength left. Mizuki figures that his time with her must be running out, but she's ready to let him go. She's at peace with the fact that he's dead, but at least she got the closure that she desperately needed to move on with her life. The following day, as they stand side by side on a hill watching the village, Mizuki wonders if there's a difference between Yusuke and her, and that makes her wonder if she could go to the other world too. Yusuke is confused with her words but she brushes him off like it was nothing. Yusuke asks if it isn't better to stay alive, then she would be able to have new experiences. Later on, Ryota sees Mizuki and Yusuke and tells them that his mother was walking with a strange man. Mizuki seems worried and Yusuke asks where they are. They run to the place where Ryota told them he saw his mother, and find Kaoru in the woods, carrying a wounded man with difficulties. The man is too heavy and they both fall on the ground. Yusuke and Mizuki arrive and approach the couple. The man looks disgruntled and absent-minded. When he notices Yusuke, he says that there's nothing human about him. In turn, Yusuke asks how he managed to get to that point. He laughs at him and Mizuki quickly approaches Kaoru and takes her away from the man. He calls Kaoru a weak-willed woman. Yusuke angrily asks how long he's going to keep roaming around his wife like that, and the man laughs again. He starts walking and says that the village is a pretty lonely place. Yusuke informs him that it was his hometown, but the man doesn't remember anything from his life anymore. He gets angry and starts hitting a tree with a stick until Yusuke holds him back. He snaps at him to stop, and the man gets a look of confusion and wonders where Kaoru is. He yells for her, not seeing that she's a couple of meters away from him, and Yusuke holds him back again. He drags the man to the floor and the man complains that he can't even see anymore. Yusuke tells him that he has been wandering for far too long, and now he has gone rotten deep inside. The man points out that Yusuke has been doing the same, and complains that while he died from the cold, Yusuke tells him that the difference between them is that he knows his limits, but the man is dragging Kaoru down because he can't get over her. The man pushes Yusuke away and angrily tells him that Kaoru is the one holding him there, because she can't get over him. He yells after her again and Yusuke tackles him and says that he isn't fit to walk the world anymore. Kaoru feels pity for her husband and asks Yusuke to leave him alone. 
that he doesn't understand himself anymore. She promises that he won't be a problem any longer and that she'll stay with him until the end. The man snaps at Yusuke again that when it gets to the stage he's at nothing good comes of it, and that Yusuke should know that. It seems that even if he is confused and lost, the man knows that Yusuke is following the same path. He's hanging on to the world of living, and if he doesn't let go soon, he'll be like him. Kaoru and the man turn leave, and Mizuki tells Yusuke they should go and leave them alone, that there are things that are easier left unfinished. Yusuke explains that he can't let that happen, and strongly asks if it's alright for Mizuki to leave the man, and Kaoru to deal with that alone. A moment passes where Kaoru and Mizuki can't see the man anymore, but Yusuke approaches him and tells him that it's over, he has to let it go. The man asks if that's the end and Yusuke confirms it. The man confesses to being scared of going. Yusuke asks what is his last wish, and as he fades from existence for good, he replies that he didn't want to die and asks Yusuke to tell that to Kaoru. The man finally rests. Kaoru falls down on her knees, grieving for her lost husband. Mizuki holds her tightly. Soon, she will be doing the same. Yusuke is not doing well anymore. He can barely walk back to the house without Mizuki's support. In the middle of the way, he complains that he's hurting. Even the sky and the wind are hurting him. Mizuki lifts him and carries him all the way to the school, where all his students are waiting for him. Yusuke starts the lesson saying that he wants to talk about the universe. He explains that the universe came from a big explosion billions of years ago, and that if they can talk about the beginning of the universe, they can also talk about the ending. Because the universe won't last forever, and it's already quite old. He wonders if the ending is near, and if suddenly it will disappear and everything will vanish. Yusu contradicts himself by saying that it won't end. Because even if for us billions of years is too old, for the universe it's just a mere instant. The universe has probably only just gotten started. He explains that one day the Earth won't be at an appropriate temperature for humans, and that the Milky Way is going to collide with another galaxy. Even that will be a mere blink in the universe, and not quite so shocking like it seems to be. Then, Yusuke turns to look at Mizuki, and while looking into her eyes he says that it won't be the end of the universe, but just the beginning. That they are only watching the beginning, and thinking about that made him very happy. He ends up saying that he feels lucky for being born at that time, and even more to have lived at that moment in time. When they go back home after his lesson, Yusuke is bursting at the seams. Mizuki has to help him walk, otherwise he won't be able to. She puts him to bed and he asks her to leave the lights on and come closer. She sits next to him on the bed and he starts touching her for the first time. He holds her face and tells her that he loves her. Then, he lets her kiss him and they make love for the last time. The next day, when she wakes up, she's alone in bed. Yusuke packed her bags and is sitting on a chair reading her prayers. He's again wearing the same clothes he arrived with. The clothes he was wearing the day he passed away. He tells her again that her handwriting is awful. Then he throws her a matchbox that she can use to set the prayers on fire. She asks him why he's giving her that and he reminds her that she said that she would go home after burning the prayers. It finally dawns on her that she will have to say goodbye to him once and for all. They take a train and go to the last place of their journey. They arrive at a port city and Yusuke is so weak that they fall down on the ground. They laugh and sit down close to watch the sea. Mizuki asks if that's the beautiful place that he wanted to show her, and Yusuke replies that it's only one of them. There are many places that are even more beautiful than where they were. She wonders if he's going to visit them, and he confirms. She asks if he has to go, and he says yes. Mizuki chokes on tears as she tells him he doesn't need to go. She hugs him close and cries, pleading for him to go home with her. Yusuke holds her for a moment before holding her face up to look at her. He tells her that he wants to apologize properly, but he didn't know how for a long time. That's why it took him three years to go back to her, because he wasn't ready to face her again, not after everything he put her through. So he wandered, meeting new people on the way and even helping some others, until he finally found the courage to go back to her. Mizuki forgives him. She touches his face for the last time, and says that they will meet again someday. She smiles at him, and Yusuke smiles back and agrees. That is the last thing Mizuki tells him before he vanishes, like all things ought to do someday. Mizuki takes the matches he gave her and sets her prayers for his protection in the other world on fire, like she promised. She watches the papers burn in tears. In front of her, the same sea that accepted Yusuke in its depths is calm. Without looking back, Mizuki grabs her bags and leaves. 